Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. After you through the news you need to know about, we run you through the fan Q&A where we answer Dolphins fans' questions. A lot of interesting news on today's show. Very exciting news, and we're going to start with that exciting news uh, on today's show. This first new story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Melvin Ingram visited the Miami Dolphins. Melvin Ingram's market has been quiet. Again, this comes from Pro Football Rumors. Melvin Ingram's market has been quiet, but it looks like it could be heating up. The free agent pass rusher visited with the Miami Dolphins uh, this past Monday. The market is a little bit competitive. He visited with the Kansas City Chiefs, I think, a few weeks before he visited with the Dolphins. So it's not like we're the only ones competing for his services. There's other teams involved, which is unfortunate because he is such a great fit for the team, a great fit for the scheme, would add so much uh, to the to the roster um, in terms of versatility. And not only that, but... You know, he would be on a pitch count. He would not be asked to play every single snap like he was in L.A., in San Diego. You know, and he's obviously had a lot of injury issues. Um, but if he came to Miami, he would be on a pitch count. He would be able to do an array of different things. Not only is he a great pass rusher, but he's a great run defender. Um, so he could do a variety of different things to help the defense. You can move him inside and outside on the defensive line. He's played middle linebacker before and been very successful at that, especially in the run game. Um, he's a great athlete. He's obviously a very good pass rusher. He would be a very good pass rusher, pass rusher within the scheme because he can move inside and outside. They can move him all around the front. He's played a 4-3 front. He's played a 3-4 front. Excuse me. He would be a perfect fit in the scheme that you have to be versatile in this scheme. Um, and, you know, he adds a veteran presence, and I know, you know, it's, you know, it's a cliche, but, it, you know, uh, if you hear successful teams talk about how important that is, and he would definitely add that, and not only that, but he's a very talented player that fits the scheme to a T, and would help us within the division, you know, I talked about this before, why Jalen Phillips was such a big get and a big pick for us was because we had a lot of issues rushing for last year. And if you watch that Buffalo game at the end of the year, and even the first time we played Buffalo in that in that um, same season uh, when we when we played them in Miami, we could not get after Josh Allen on a consistent basis with a four man pass rush. We did a lot better when we played them in Miami. We had a couple of um, uh, plays where we we did a great job of collapsing the pocket, but. For the most part, even when Brian Flores has been here, we've had a very, very hard time getting pressure with sending four and three, which Brian does a lot of, and New England's really good at doing that. New England's really good at sending three, dropping a lot of people back, and still getting pressure. Uh, that's what, you know, they've had a lot of success with that in the past with, you know, players like Dante Hightower and Chandler Jones and some of the, you know, pass searches they've had in the past. And anytime we were in those situations and did it, it was a huge, huge, huge negative, uh, and especially when we played the Buffalo Bills. I mean, it, it just didn't work. And not only that, but when we did rush 4-3 and three, uh, against Buffalo, and especially when we're on the road, um, even, even, even when we played them in Miami, and this is why we've had such a tough time with him, anytime we have collapsed the pocket, we don't have the athletes, and especially the first two, year Brian, first two years Brian was here, we had a lot of trouble containing him in his speed. Now, we've had a... Brian's done a better job. He did a better job last year because he had better talent at, at trying to contain him. You know, Josh did a lot of damage in the pocket the last game that we played him. So it's not like we're not disciplined or anything. But when he does break the pocket, we, we didn't really have the athletes on both sides of the line to kind of disrupt him in the middle in terms of the pass rush pushing the pocket up the middle and on the edges. We just really didn't have uh, the athletes to kind of pursue him when he does break the pocket, when you see teams like Kansas City, what Chris Jones and Frank Clark were able to do to that offensive line, putting pressure on him uh, on the outside and in the inside and have the athleticism to pursue him uh, and not let him do damage with his legs, um, not only just to, you know, not scramble for 10 yards, but when he does break the pocket, you know, he's very deadly on the run. And, you know, those are broken plays, those are big plays, and what teams have been successful at when they played him um, is when he does break the pocket, there's someone always in his face. He's always under pressure, uh, and he can't make those throws. And that's something that the Dolphins weren't able to do. And every time we blitzed, and this is a great example, because we basically didn't blitz at all when we played them in Buffalo. And I think Brian got scared because 
uh, of the first time that we played them in Miami, when we blitzed, they hit a bunch of big plays on us. Um, and we really couldn't hold up well. And again, granted, we didn't have Byron Jones and Xavier was injured at this point. Uh, but we did not do a good job of blitzing them either. And they did a good job of the in the first game and second game of preparing for that. And they had plays off of it, and we just couldn't stop it. So we couldn't blitz them. And when we rushed three and four, it was also a huge negative. I mean, he got way too much time. It, and if it wasn't uh, completion and rhythm, uh, it was a broken play that ended up resulting in either a 20-yard scramble or you know, a first down, him throwing the football. So... We have a lot of uh, we had excuse me we had a lot of issues with that last year and we improved that dramatically. Getting Whitney Merciless, who's a fantastic pass rusher and a great he's not just a middle linebacker he's a fantastic blitzer, fantastic and he's great in the run game. He's a great athlete too, uh, so he helps the pass rush. You add Jalen Phillips, who is a fantastic one on one pass rusher, and Emmanuel Ogba is a good player. He's a he's a he's a good pass rusher, but he couldn't do it by himself. Um, and Shaq Lawson was at best inconsistent and Van Ginkle had his moments, but you know, he can, you know, he's not the talent that Jalen Phillips, Jalen Phillips is and even Ogba or, um, uh, who, who I, Melvin Ingram, and, and at least not right now. Uh, and some of the things that we, in terms of being a pass rusher, I think Van Ginkle could get there. He has the ability to, and he's definitely... Uh, you know, getting to that point. But as of right now, he is not better than those three players. And it, especially when it comes to being dominant and, and uh, you know, consistently winning one-on-one matchups. And I think Van Kuchel got better at that as the year went on. You know, the Raiders game is a great example of that. Uh, but I think those three are more talented. Um, and you add Whitney Merciless to the mix, the pass rush should be significantly better. And if the Dolphins were able to sign Melvin Ingram... You know, that would help a great deal as well, rushing three, rushing four. Being able to put him inside and rush against the guard, you know, that's something Raekwon Davis kind of wasn't the greatest at, was consistently cl- collapsing the pocket He, um, when he was over the center. And, um, you know, really, I think he did an okay job in the run game. I think that criticism's, criticism uh, is... A little crazy, and I think that's why you hear a lot of people saying that you know they're going to switch him to defensive end. You know, Omar Kelly said that uh, a few times. But my point is, is that if the Dolphins were able to get Melvin Ingram, that would help. That they're probably their best package, and New England's best package is when they d- get creative. They drop out. They're rushing three. They're rushing four, and they do creative things up front, like putting Melvin Ingram on the inside, like putting Dante Howard at defensive end to create havoc up front and those guys are so talented that you can rush three and rush four uh and have a very good pass rush on a consistent basis to get pressure on a consistent basis and that just helps the secondary and that marriage is well with a very very good secondary in the back end and that's why i think the defense is going to be significantly better than it was a year ago i think it's better it's going to be better against the run because the addition of whitney merciless and jalen phillips um, and if you add Melvin Ingram into that, then literally there is a zero flaws on that defense. Zero. I, I, people have complained about the linebacker situation. I think that's completely fixed with the additions that we've made. We, you, talk, you talk about Phillips. If they're able to add Melvin Ingram, there's no flaws at all in this defense. Uh, it would be flawless. So, And I, to be honest with you, right now, I, don't, I'm, I think this is a top five defense in the league. Um, in my opinion, and I think it's the best defense in the division. Um, I would take it over any of the other defenses in this division in a heartbeat. Um, so, if you add Melvin Ingram to that, uh, it just it just puts us in a different stratosphere. And again, it helps us beat Buffalo. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know why my voice cracked right there. It gives us the ability to rush three and four. He's a great athlete. You can put him inside so we could get pressure up the middle. Melvin Ingram is such a great athlete that if he, and he is very good at rushing inside, that if he does shed inside, it's over. You know, Josh Allen is not getting out of the pocket. He's going to get sacked or he's going to have to throw the football away. So he adds versatility and he helps the pass rush. He helps us in the run game uh, because of his versatility. Um, and he, he would automatically make us the best defense in football, in my opinion. Um, and uh, it would not even be an argument to who has the best defense in the AFC East. It wouldn't even be close, in my opinion. Um, I mean, New England has a good um, 
secondary, but I, you know, I, I think as a group, and I think our linebackers, our defensive linemen, um, our you know the back end, to me, it would be the best in the division and definitely a top three, top five unit in the, in the entire league. Please, Miami, sign Melvin Ingram. <laughs> because if you do, it's a flawless defense and probably the best defense we've had in many years. Definitely, the, it would be the be- in terms of roster. It would be the best we had. That would I would, that de- that roster and that defense would be the best of the last ten years. I would take that defense over any of them, and especially you marry you marry that with the scheme. Um, that's a deadly combination, dude. So I hope this gets done. Um, I think this this would be amazing, and it would fits Melvin Ingram. And again, he would be on a pitch count. The injury thing wouldn't, you, you know. If he played 10 games, that would be a win for the Dolphins. Like he's they're not relying on him to start and play significant minutes. You know, his services would just be a like icing on the cake at that point. It, it's not something that it's not it's like it's not like he's the foundation and if if we lost him then the, the whole house crumbles down, you know. So that's another huge positive of it in itself is he doesn't have to be relied on to be that superstar anymore and, and especially in this defense and I think that would lead to him having a kind of a renaissance in his career and being healthy. Um, and he fits the scheme. So I, I there's, you know, and Brian liked him, uh, I think, last year, in last offseason. And he obviously, you know, it was heavily rumored to be a Dolphin um, when he was fr- free uh, the last time. So there is some, there's a connection there. There's a great fit there. He wouldn't be asked to do a whole lot. He's going to a really good team. I don't understand. What, it's like, hey, man, let's get it done. Get, cut one of these receivers that we don't need and sign Melvin Ingram. Um, I would... And, and if you if you came to me right now and said, well, who would you rather have? Even if you said Najee Harris or one of those running backs, or would you rather have Melvin Ingram? I would pick Melvin Ingram. I think this guarantees to me playoffs. Not that it... You know, honestly, to be honest with you, I, I'm already guaranteeing. I think the playoffs are... In a, in an inevitability, uh, I, I can't say the word. In an inevitability, uh, you guys know what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry, but um, it, I think it's you know it's going to happen whether Melvin comes here or not. But I, it, to me, I, I don't know. This just would put us in a different category, dude. Um, it would be like icing on the cake. I would want this over a running back if I'm being honest. I, I think he's such a great fit. Um, this would be a monster signing if the Dolphins were able to get it done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about Melvin Ingram right now. Um, I think we covered it. He would be great. He would be a great addition to the team. Hopefully he doesn't go to the Chiefs. I'm sure by the, you know, Monday, you, you know, how these things go, he will be a Chief, but hopefully not. Hopefully he will be in Miami and ha- just putting up numbers. This defense would be putting up numbers. Dude, people would be so scared of this defense. Like, coaches week in and week out just looking at the roster would be like, I don't know what we're supposed to do. Like, we match up so well with any offense in the league at that point that there would be no, we wouldn't be going into any games at a disadvantage. Um, we would be a matchup a nightmare for a lot of teams. Um, every team in the league, if we, if we were to get something like this done. And I think we are right now, but I just, like I said, I think this, this would evolve the defense into special category. Um, what else are we going to talk about? Dude, I have to- I to- a total blank... T- oh, okay. This next news story isn't much of news, and I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes right now. I can just feel the eyes being rolled, you know, because I-, I know a lot of people don't want this to happen. I'm-, I'm totally... I want this to happen. I think, you know, this particular player that we're about to talk about would bring a lot to the team, and it's not much of... It's not concrete news, but, you know... If ESPN can make an entire 15-minute video about something as stupid as this, then we can talk about it here for a second. So, you know, Le'Veon Bell liked an Instagram post that the Dolphins posted about how how um, uh, a successful of a season they've had, or off-season, excuse me, they've had so far, and he liked the post. Um, and obviously they had a connection last year because they were in talks to acquire him, so he's familiar with the situation. So clearly there is some mutual interest there. I mean, he's not just going to like the post. He's talked with the Dolphins front office previously, obviously last year. So there's a connection there. I think there is some substance to this. Um, 
So I love Le'Veon Bell. You know, he's not as fast as he used to be, uh, but I think he can help the team in other areas. You know, we always talk about getting two of people who, who can help him in the quick passing game because that's a strength of his is making quick reads and quick decisions. And he has such a quick release and he's so accurate uh, that it really could lead to a very successful run game, or excuse me, quick pass game. And Le'Veon Bell is a perfect fit for that. Not only can he line up at receiver still, I still believe he can do that, but he's such a threat in the op- in open space as a receiver. So he can turn a first down, a first and 10, and, you know, you throw him a two-yarder out. He can turn that into eight yards. So I, I still think he can do that. I still think he's a valuable asset in the run game. He's a strong runner, patient. Um, and so I think he can put us in a lot of favorable situations. It could be very helpful in the passing game. And he's a playmaker, and I still feel like he is. You know, he's only 29 years old. Um, I know he, he's never been fast, though. You know, people keep bringing up the fact that he's lost speed. He's never been a home run hitter in, in his entire career. Even in, when he was in his prime, he wasn't fast. You know, I think his largest, his, I think his longest run in his career isn't, isn't over 40 yards. So um, Le'Veon Bell has always been kind of a, you know, not a, necessarily a burner, but he, you know, he's always making people miss in the open field. He's always, you know, falling forward and getting extra yards. And obviously he has that infamous patient style that he brings as well, that not a lot of people can emulate. So um, I like Le'Veon Bell, especially for what he can bring in the passing game. And, you know, people always bring up the comparison to Miami and New England. And if this passing game is going to be like New England's, then he would be a perfect fit for that, for being that James White and being, you know, that Danny Woodhead uh, and being very involved in the passing game. Uh, that way and he's perfect for that so I think for all of those reasons he would be a great fit and I think he still has some football left in his career and I think he would be you know a a good addition to the offense and and someone that can help us and you know like I said you know he's he's a matchup nightmare when you put him on linebackers and safeties uh and he's a good run after the catch player so I I like Le'Veon Bell I still think he has a lot of football left in him and uh, would be a good addition to the team. So again, to recap, he liked an Instagram post that the Dolphins posted on how successful an offseason they've had. Um, and, you know, and that's obviously... And there's been interest there between the two parties, so we'll see what happens with it. I doubt that, you know, the more these the, the, the weeks go on, the more I'm starting to think that... I think at the very least you're going to get two more significant... Maybe just one more significant signing, and hopefully it's Melvin Ingram. Um... But I think the team, and it feels like the team and the organization, unless something happens with Deshaun Watson, um, it feels like this is this is probably going to be the roster. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect Le'Veon Bell. I hope, listen, if they got Le'Veon and, and, and Melvin, I mean, that would be awesome. Um, but um, we'll see what they end up doing. Uh, it seems like the, the they're setting their ways a little bit. Uh, but I hope they, you know, at least get Melvin. That would be awesome. Um, moving on to this next new story, it's caused a lot of waves in the Dolphins community, uh, and uh, it, to me, I don't care. This doesn't, I don't, I really don't care. It, it doesn't bother me at all. This is like the least, you know, um, I mean, I don't understand why so many people have a strong opinion about this um, in a negative way. In a positive way, I get it, but in a negative way, I don't understand it. Like, you know, you, you know let's get into the news. I'm already getting ahead of myself. So this next news story, if, you, if you're not familiar, Tua did an interview at OTA's Voluntary Workouts, and he said that, he said a lot of things. Um, and one of the things that people are freaking out about is he said that, if you're not, I'm sure you guys already know, but in case you don't know, um, he said that he didn't fully grasp the playbook. And, you know, this is something that we talked about on the show, and it's something everybody noticed, that the play calling was different. It got better as the year went on, which I think is, it speaks to how what how true what Tua is saying, that he didn't grasp the playbook. Now, he didn't say he didn't, he didn't learn the plays. He said that checking and reading NFL defenses and checking to the right protections in, ter- in terms of blitz pickups and stuff of that nature had to be dumbed down for him. And what do we hear about rookies all the time is they have to learn the game. You know, it's not that two is lazy. It's that the game, and, you know, Chris Sims said on NFL and NBC, NBC Sports is that he heard from people that Tua, you know, the the complexity of the game surprised him. And how, um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? How, how mental the game is. 
you know, it, it is a very mental game. And we hear it all the time with people like Tom, all the successful quarterbacks, even Dan Marine, everybody. We hear about how mental the game actually is. And, and he, like I said, he basically said, and he did specifically say that he struggled with protections, he struggled with getting calls out on the line, all that stuff, which is very common. And we hear it all the time. We just never hear a rookie quarterback say it. So for people like, you know, you heard about Matt, you know, I read that, you know, Matt Hasselbeck said that's all alarming and stuff like that nature. Like, it's like a Dwayne Haskins situation. It's not, he's not lazy. He works hard. It just, it takes time to learn the game. You know, it takes time to learn that stuff. Everyone struggled with that. You know, hear about everybody struggling with that. At least he's getting better at it. And you could tell that he got better at it as the year went on, you know, with the play calling kind of got a little bit more aggressive um, like it, it didn't move, it never, and you know, this is another thing that not only was the play calling more conservative and more simple when you talk about bootlegs, it was just bootlegs and RPOs, but when Fitz came in, obviously the offense ran faster. It was a more oiled machine. It was more aggressive, you know, and as fans, we saw that. So again, you know, that is something that all rookies go through. I don't understand why this is such a big deal. You know, he was candid about it. I have the exact quote here. He said, Tua said, quote, in his interview, this is the exact quote. He said, last year for me, I wasn't as comfortable just in general. I wasn't comfortable calling comfortable calling plays. I just didn't have the comfortability of checking plays and alerting plays. I just rode with the play. Even if I knew it wasn't going to work, I was going to try to make it work. I didn't actually know the playbook necessarily really, really good. And that's no one else's fault but my own. Our play calls were simple when I was in. I didn't have alerts and checks. Uh, where now I feel comfortable and I can maneuver uh, my way through things. So again, this is something that all rookies have said and everybody has said in the past. Reading defenses, getting to the right play, getting to the right protection. You know, Tua said that he knew, which is a great sign, that it wasn't the right play for that specific coverage. But he hiked the ball anyway because he thought, oh, listen, I'll just make it happen. Like I did at Alabama, and that's, you know, that's not it. That's not the National Football League. And, you know, that's the mental part of the game uh, is, you know, messing up what the defense is trying to do. If you know that this play isn't going to work in, against that specific defense, then, of course, like just like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, all of the veteran quarterbacks in the league like Fitz did for, the, for our offense last year, you check to the right play. You check to the right protection. You check to the right play. When You know, some people don't really understand this, you know, people think in Madden terms, but when you check to a different play in the NFL, you have to check to the protection as well. You have to literally tell the offensive lineman how they have to block on this play. Every single time you change a play, it's not just changing routes, it's also changing the protection. And you have to vocalize that to the entire team, to the 10 other men that are on the field. Okay? So it's very difficult to do that. And not to mention the fact that the NFL is 100,000 100, light years fast when you hike the football. So not only did you have to go, and you have to literally process things that fast and make the read, make the right read, make the right play. So that, that's where all of this mental side of the game comes from. And of course you're not going to know and, and, and get that down your rookie year. No quarterback, like look at everybody else's rookie year that had to, you know, that's every prominent NFL quarterback that had to start year one. They all had to go through this. I mean, everybody talks about how they, you know, they had to rely on their physical abilities their rookie year, and then they finally started to get the mental part of the game. And, that, and that's exactly what Tua was talking about right here. He's a hard worker. We, we've heard that if he was lazy and didn't care and didn't care to learn the plays, then we would know. It's like math or anything else. It's like it takes, you know, it takes time to learn it. You're not, you know, that doesn't mean you're not paying attention in class. It could still be hard, you know. It, so there's a big difference between, you know, having trouble learning something uh, and, you know, learning something that's new to you and just not trying at all. <clears throat> so it, it's a different game than college. We all know that it takes time to learn it. So for me, I don't, I don't understand. This was not news to me. We all, we've heard this a million times before with other people and other players, so people need to chill out. <clears throat> um, 
What else? We have one more news story. Oh, this next news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Emmanuel Ogba did not show up to volunteer workouts. Neither did a ton of other players like Xavier Howard, Jerome Baker didn't show up, some of those prominent players. And people are speculating the fact that the Dolphins may be moving on from Emmanuel Ogba because they had Melvin Ingram in for a visit. That is not going to happen. I don't. I, that is not going to happen. We've heard nothing but great things about Emmanuel Ogba since he got to Miami between Josh Boyer, the defensive coordinator, and Brian Flores, and how you know how important he was to the defense. I don't think he's going anywhere. He's a veteran player. Veteran players don't show up to voluntary things. They just don't. It is what it is. You know, the Dolphins had a record number of people show up to their voluntary workouts. It's it's normal. And, uh, you know, people were speculating about the Xavier Howard situation just, you know, because he didn't show up to volunteer. Dude, they're old. They're old. Okay? This is just something that happens. I, I You know, they work out on their own. You know, Xavier Howard posted a video the other day of him working out with a bunch of other NFL defensive backs. I mean, he's still, you know, working out, but he's working out at, at his own pace, and that's what veteran players do. So to me, I, I wouldn't worry about this if I were, if, if I were you guys. I don't think because Emmanuel Agba didn't show up to voluntary workouts and they visited with Melvin Ingram, those are two. I think you Emmanuel Agba will be on the team, uh, and hopefully Melvin Ingram will be too, but I don't think the two those two things have to do with... You know, the Dolphins could move on from some of these receivers too. I'm, you know, I'm waiting for it to happen. You know, free up some cap space. Maybe, and, you know, I don't know the... I know that if they... I think if they move on from... I mean, if they move on from Albert Wilson, Alan Hearns, and Jakeem Grant, that has to... That has to you know, I don't know how much dead cat money there'd be, but um, that's got to be worth something. And uh, so we'll see what they end up doing. But they can move some players to make some cap space. And they can move one of these receivers. So I hope they do. Um, we'll see. But I, I wouldn't worry about this whole Emmanuel Agba not showing up to camp thing. Um, and the Dolphins obviously visiting with Mel. I don't think, I think that he'll be on the team and everything will be fine. Let me look up, um, before we get into the fan Q&A, if you made it 28 minutes into this video, I'm going to look up Emmanuel Ogba's contract really quick. Did he not just get an extension, or am, am I crazy? Has he not gotten one yet? I just want to make sure really quick. I'm sorry, everybody. Emmanuel Ogba signed a two-year, $15 million contract with the Miami Dolphins, including $7 million of that guaranteed. Um, when was it? Wait, okay. So does he have a year left on his deal? Okay, so he has a year left on his deal. <clears throat> so... Yeah, I don't see him moving. I think if, if they were if they were going to, they would have already done it, especially after dra uh, drafting Jalen Phillips. So... Um, I, I don't, um, I don't think he's leaving. Well, I mean, next year we'll see, because obviously Mike Isicki, Jerome Baker, free agents, we'll see what the, and we, the Dolphins are going to have a good amount of cap space next year, because the cap is going up significantly next year. So I don't know, maybe he still does come back next year. Um, the thing is about Ogba, he's such a great scheme fit. That if he gets paid big numbers, because he will have a big year this year because of the nature. This defense is really good, and he, and he's real. He's a good player, and he, he does such a good job in this game. That you know, if he gets paid, it, I can see him getting overpaid to go somewhere else, and that's fine. Um, but uh, it's similar to New England, where I just you know, if he goes somewhere else, I don't think he'll have the same amount of success. If he goes to somewhere where they play a four three every play, or you know, and, and they're nickel defense on passing downs. Or if you go somewhere where they're in a 3-4 three, four, three, four front every play and they're playing cover three every play, he's not going to have that. you got to move him around. you got to be creative. To, to you know, He's got to be in this scheme to be that guy. I don't think he can be that in a traditional scheme. And we've seen that with him. You know, He's been a good player. He, he had a good year with the Chiefs his last season there. But uh, I don't think he can be the guy that we – he can be a double-digit sack guy on a consistent basis in this scheme. I don't think he can do that other in other places. So we'll see how... I don't think he's going anywhere, uh, and I don't think we have to worry about it. All right, let's get into the fan QA. This first question comes from Richard. He says, what about the Dolphins bringing in Pat's running back, Sony Michelle? If if he were cut June 1, because Pat's drafted uh, Stevenson, or Seattle running back, Rashard Penny, 
Both running backs have a history of injuries. Could be June uh, June first cuts. Um, you make a great point. I think that I think that's a great time for the Dolphins. I think they're waiting for that, and hopefully they're not doing that with Melvin Ingram because I just want a consolation to the story at this point. I need to know because just the thought of Melvin Ingram being a Dolphin is so awesome that I just don't have to wait a month. You know, or not a month. It's actually right around the corner, but. I don't have to wait long. Just give, just tell me. You know, go to Kansas. Break my heart. Go to Kansas City. I, I don't. I hate having it ever, dude. It's the worst when someone, when a great player comes and visits, and then he's, next thing you know, he's in Baltimore. It's like, god dang, man. It's the worst, dude. I hate it. I, I have literally over the years gotten to the point where I can't, like, if, you know, I, I don't want to watch them. Like, anytime we get a new player, you know, you go on these deep dives and watching them play, um, and. Uh, I can't do that. I can't do it anymore and until they're actually here. So just come on, you know. I don't have to wait this long for Melvin Ingram, but I, I do agree with you, Richard, that I think that the Dolphins will make a lot of these extra moves, whether it's in training camp or after June 1st. I, I, I definitely think that's – you could see some extra things there. So, yeah, if, like, Sonny Michelle got cut, and I think that's why they would wait. It's like, okay, maybe someone gets cut that we like. Uh, and let's be a little bit patient and not be so hasty signing someone with like Le'Veon Bell when you could get a Sony Michelle or someone like that. So I, I think that's when you'll see the Dolphins kind of round out their off season. Uh, the sixth question comes from SM. He says, "Skags, I mentioned your name on uh, Dougie Do Wrong's live podcast, and he said he does watch your channel and he loves your content. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, that's really cool." Uh, I gotta watch that video if uh, if uh, if that happened. <laughs> That's really 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 cool. It, and again, I would love to do a guest, if like a guest, uh, you know, be a guest on his show. I just don't have the means to have him on this show yet, and we're getting to that point. But I would love to go, you know, over there and and, and do something like that. That would be really cool. Um, this next question comes from uh. KC, he says, I believe the image of Tua around the NFL was that play, that he played safe and conservative. In his own words, he didn't have the playbook, so he was limited. He was the opposite of the risk taker Fitzmagic. Do you expect him to make a big jump in year two? I believe he was 6-3 and three and he, does, he doesn't deserve negative press. I agree. And one of the other things that he said in that interview that I thought was fascinating, and you know, if you watch the Chris Sims podcast, he gets into the depths of you know, being how, how you can be successful with your mechanics as as a quarterback, and he breaks down what makes Tom Brady so as such a what makes him have such good mechanics, and how technical they are, and how you know Aaron Rodgers is so good at it with his mechanics. He breaks down what what um what goes into that, and what you know how great mechanics can lead to you being a great quarterback. And one of the things that he brings up all the time is using your hips, and. Tua said something really interesting in, in his interview where he was like, I'm not, you know, last year I was throwing with mostly my arm and I wasn't really using my full body. I wasn't using my hips to throw. And now he's saying this offseason he can finally, you know, he said he, feel, he feels 10 times better in the interview. He went on to say that, you know, he's finally throwing with his hips as well. He's not just using his arm. So I think that's huge. I mean, that's a big deal, dude. That's a huge deal. You know, if you've ever played backyard, and I don't know, maybe not. If Like, if you've ever been anywhere or, you know, if you've ever heard anybody talk about throwing a football on any kind of competitive level, you know, that's a huge, using your entire body and not just your arm is a big deal. And, um, and, and it adds to your arm strength and everything, accuracy, all of that stuff. So the fact that he's, the fact that he was throwing with all arm last year is crazy. Um, that goes to show you how strong, and I know when we watched two last year, we were like, oh my God, what an arm. But he had, I mean, the throw to, the, some of the throws he made in the Cardinals game, the fact that he did that with all arm is crazy. Like, the throw that he had on third and nine to Devontae Parker against Patrick Peterson was a, like a laser beam. And the fact, you know, the fact that he, he, he couldn't use his full body to throw is crazy. So I think all of those things, if you think about the playbook and how he's getting more comfortable with that and getting more comfortable with the NFL game, all that stuff, yeah, I think he'll... And the offense is better. So all of those things, I think, are going to lead to him having a, a, a very good year. So I'd agree with you, Casey, that I think you will have a better year. This next question comes from SM. He says, Skaggs, do you go to any games? What games would you like to see this season? Um, The games that I would love, I mean, any home game, any game, really. I mean, it doesn't matter. I would love to see all of the games. So there's not anything specific. Um, 
Uh, this next question comes from Lois, or Lewis. He says been watching a lot of uh, DC stuff, and I keep saying Lois. It's, it's Lewis. Anyway, this question comes from Lewis. He says, I think our defense will be better. Your thoughts? Yes, significantly better. We talked about it earlier in the podcast for, for all the reasons I brought up. Um, it's more athletic. It's better against the, you know, it's more versatile. Um, it's better against, in the pass rush aspect, it's better, you know, we're going to be better against the run. Every, pr- we're faster in the back end, all of those things. So, yes, the defense will be way better. And the thing that's going to make it better is the pass rush. And being able to just rush three and four and be consistently good at it, and you marriage that with a great secondary, that's when things get crazy. When you can rush three and four and get pressure, and you have people on the back end that can man up, that's, as an offense, it's a game over. If you can get consistent pressure with three and four, it's over. It's over. That's what that's what the great defenses do. There's nothing you can do as an offense, and especially when you're great in coverage, and the Dolphins have great cover players at the linebacker level as well, when you can get consistent pressure with four, it's over. I mean, you might as well pack up and go home. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing, and especially when you can't get the run game going, it's over. It's over. So I think the Dolphins got way better in that aspect of the game. So I think, and again, to, 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 to kind of, you know, be a little bit more clear, what I'm saying is, is, yes, the defense is way better because it's better against the run with the addition of Whitney Merciless and Jalen Phillips. And it's better, it's way, it's going to be way better at rushing three and four. This next question comes from SM. He says, Malcolm Perry, wide receiver, Smythe. Excuse me, he says, Malcolm Perry, Malcolm Perry, wide receiver, Durham Smythe, tight end. Who are some of the players that were on the team last season that don't make the squad this year? I think Durham Smythe will, will make it. Malcolm Perry is going to be kind of tough, but I actually think he will make it. He's got a good chance of making it. I think the guys that you got to worry about is like Jakeem Grant, Allen Hearns, and Albert Wilson. I think those are the three guys that one of the, maybe all three of them don't make the team. So I think those are some of the guys that you got to worry about if 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 you even care to lose those guys. No offense to Jakeem and Albert and Allen, but especially Jakeem, play better. Okay. This next question comes from Mike. He says, "I love the Dolphins. Would you come to my bar, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, Mike?" Bar mitzvah, so that means you're what, 13? No. I'm sorry, Mike. I can't do it. Cannot do it. Hope you have a great bar mitzvah. I think then that you would be 13 at that point. Um, and a lot of I'm it, Well, I guess you could, you're probably in Miami. If I had to guess, Mike, where you live, I would say New Jersey or maybe New York. But if I had to guess, it could also be easily just easily in Miami, too. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to, because there's a lot of Dolphins fans in New Jersey. Um, I don't know. I could be wrong. You guys, let me know, Mike. Uh, this next question comes, and I, I don't want to be rude, but uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it's not gonna happen, Mike. But I appreciate that. That's really cool. I've never been invited to a bar mitzvah before. Um, so and and, and just saying, and, and and you saying, if you're serious, Mike, you're not trolling over here. Um, that's you know, it's kind of it's cool. It's like not everybody can say that. So it is a great honor that you asked that, but. Uh, yeah, not not gonna be able to go there. Mike Lewis. Moving on from that, this next question comes from Tombstone, and I'm sure everybody loved that for the the last two minutes. People really loved that, loved listening to that one. And it's not a fist to you, Mike, but I shouldn't have talked about that for as long as I did. Anyway, this next question comes from Stone. He says, hey, can you do a 53-man roster prediction? Yes, I will do that. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about in today's show is the schedule, and I completely forgot about that again. Um... And we, it's at this point, we might be able to fit it in at the end here. This next question comes from SM. He says, still ranked third in our own division behind Buffalo and New England by most so-called analysts. Are they correct? No, they're not. And I'm very, I'm looking forward to proving them wrong. This next question comes from Bad Bandit. He says, hey, Skaggs, I keep hearing that Robert Hunt will be moved to guard do you think this is a smart move, kicking him inside in favor of a rookie uh, when Hunt played so well at tackle? Uh, if so, what makes you think he will be better at guard versus tackle? Well, the thing that I think that makes him better at guard is he he's a the thing that he does best is move people out of the way in the run game. And you really want your guards to be to, to do that at a high level, more so than your tackles. 
Um, especially if you're running a power game, if you're running up the middle inside a lot, um, you want your guards to be able to move people on a consistent basis. So Robert Hunt, that's the best thing he does, and he's a good pass protector as well. So uh, he's physical, he's great in the run game, so I, that's why he's, he's being moved in a two guard. And I think they're very confident in Eichenberg and Jesse and uh, Austin uh, to fill those roles. And we've heard of some talk about Kinley, may, maybe Solomon moves out to, to tackle, which I could see him being a very successful right tackle. You know, he's a great pass protector. You know, the thing, one of the things I would be scared about is, is he athletic enough to do it? I don't know. He would have to use, lose a little bit of weight, but we'll see. But I think those are some of the reasons why Robert would be a better guard than tackle. This next question comes from Mark. He says, so an interesting interview Tua gave. He said he did know the playbook and that they even consented it, and he uh, and he basically, it was lost and probably not ready to play. What are your thoughts? Was he rushed, or on is this on Tua for not being prepared? Will he and the offense look uh, light years different from the past year enough to make the playoffs? So your first question is, what are your thoughts? Was he rushed, or is this on Tua for not being prepared? I don't think it's it's just learning it. I think people are not understanding that what he's meaning by that. I I don't I think he was prepared. It just takes some time to learn all of that stuff and be you know, it's like anything you like, you know, if you learn, if you learn and you're learning something for a long time, it becomes second nature, like language. It's the same thing. It takes a while to learn it. He'll he'll eventually he'll get so good at it, he doesn't even have to think about that stuff. It's not him being prepared, it's about him learning it and being good at it has nothing to do with that. You know, I, I, I think Tua was in there every single day. Try, and Ryan said it all the entire season. He's in here every single day working. Um, I don't think it has him has anything to do with him being prepared. I think it, um, it it just takes a while to learn the game. And I know he said that, you know, that's on him for not maybe fully grasping the playbook. But that to me, that's learning it. Learning the playbook. Learning everything. It takes a while. You know, he, he and memorizing it, you know, when he looks at cover two, he knows exactly what to check to. When he gets this specific blitz he saw in film, he knows exactly what to check to. And he doesn't have to think about it. He just says it. So all of those things will come in time. He's not going to do that as rookie season. Um, so I don't think it has anything to do with Tua. I think we, from everything we've heard, he's a hard worker. I just think it it's just him adapting to the game. And then the second thing you asked is, yes, the offense will look, I mean, to answer your question, Mark, I mean, yes, it's, from a talent perspective, it's going to be way better. And from a play calling, I think the play calling is going to be more creative. And I think Tua is going to be better uh, because he's going into year two. He's healthier, like we just talked about with the hip thing and the throwing. And he's, and he's more, obviously, he's had a lot of experience in the NFL and the NFL game. And, you know, one thing I will say about this whole situation about Tua he didn't turn the ball. I mean, obviously the last game, you know, he had three turnovers. Um, but the entire year, and this is something Chris has said, Chris has said on his podcast, and, it, you know, Tua is really good at playing the game, you know, and not messing it up for the team. I mean, he didn't, and it, for a rookie, that's very impressive. And, uh, you know, he, he's only going to get better. And um, so, yeah, for all of those reasons, the offense will be way better. This next question comes from Beef. He says, hey, Skaggs. He says, since we didn't draft a prospect, draft a prospect running back this year, uh, this year's draft. Do you think we're eyeing a running back prospect in next year's draft? Um, yeah. I mean, I could see that. I, I don't know. That it's it's kind of hard to look that far ahead. They could address it in free agency. They could address it this season. But I definitely think it's a priority. They've tried to address it many times, despite what other people think. Um. It just hasn't worked out that way, but I, I definitely think beef that that will be addressed, whether it's this year or next year. So let's take a look at the schedule before we end the podcast. I'm sorry, I, I completely forgot about it again, but we'll take a quick look at it and then we'll get you, we'll get out of here. Hopefully, you guys made it 40 minutes in, um, but uh, we'll run through the we'll run through the through the uh, the uh, schedule really quick. All right, let's get into it. Uh, you know, and really, to be honest with you, it's probably not even worth talking about because you guys have probably heard it from a diff a thousand different people already. So who cares? But uh, and who cares? I mean, honestly, God, what am I honestly going to add to any of this? But uh, let's get into this. One thing I do have to say about the schedule that people keep bringing up—they're like, "Oh, the first four games are tough." I mean, what do you? Uh, you have um, 
uh, New England in Gillette. Uh, then they go on the road to Buffalo. No, excuse me, Buffalo comes here, right? Or am I crazy? Hold on, let me look. Yeah, no, Buffalo comes to Miami. So it's basically a repeat of last year. And then we go on the road. And then we're still at home, I believe. No, we go on the road to Las Vegas. So basically, we play the, the Patriots, Bills, Raiders, and Colts. And people think that's tough. First of all, we're way better than the Raiders. and The Raiders are worse than they were a year ago. And we beat them a year ago. The Colts... I mean, they met. It's a terrible matchup for them. They don't have a lot of playmakers on offense. I mean, if even if they do get Julio Jones, it's you know, who okay, um, you know they they don't really have a name brand running back. You know they have Jonathan Taylor, who they hope becomes that, and obviously Naheem Naheem Hines, who's a good player. Their offensive line is good. Got a little worse because of some of the retirements uh, of Costanzo. Obviously, I think they uh, ended up getting Eric Fisher, right? So their their offensive line isn't as good as it was. As, as it was in the past, it's not the, the big blue wall, as people called it. Um, and uh, so th- they're not better than us. Their defense is okay. It's anytime we play, anytime you play a team that's zone heavy, I feel like you can beat them. Um, even if they do have good talent, you know, obviously it's not gonna be easy. But I, I, if you're a great team, that, if you're if you're like the Broncos and Patriots of the past, it's like I mean, we might as well just not even show up because it's it's hard to get off man coverage when you're that good at it. Zone, you can outsmart if you have good coaches. So their defense is not that, you know, not crazy. So I, I I think we're a better team than them. So I disagree with this whole, like, the first four games are tough. I mean, yes, the Bills are tough, but we can win any of the other three games easily. So, I, and, then, and then after the month of September ends and we played the Colts, Bills, Raiders, and Patriots... We go into October, where we play the Buccaneers, uh, Jaguars, and Falcons, and Bills again, uh, which is awesome that we get the Bills this early on in the year. And it's still going to be cold as balls down there, but uh, you know, I, I would rather play them in October than in December. So the October schedule is pretty easy. I mean, the Buccaneers, I we could, you know, do we play them on the road? You know, who cares? I mean, we got to go up to Raymond James Stadium. Who cares? I think we can beat Tom Brady and the Bucks. He's the Bucks, a little bit overrated in my opinion. So I think we could definitely beat them. Um, the Jags, we don't need. I mean, yes, of course. The Falcons after that, those are both easy games. Those are all three winnable games. The Bills at at, at uh, in Miami is going to be awesome. Or excuse me, on the road. I keep saying in Miami, on the road in Buffalo. Both of those games I'm, I'm super excited about. To get those out of the way early in the year I think is a blessing. We don't have to play them in December. And then um, <clears throat> playing Houston to round out that four-game stretch. That's a pretty good That's a pretty good mid-year. That's a pretty easy schedule right there for the mid-year. And then we get to the end of the year where we play Baltimore uh, the, in, no, in November. Um, and that game is in Miami, thank God. That's going to be a tough game. I mean, you know, playing that scheme and Lamar Jackson is very hard. And uh, their offensive line got worse. Um, their defense is always kind of, is, I mean, their defense is always tough. So it's going to be a tough game. So that's a tough first game. Then we got the Jets. I love that they saved the Jets for the end of the year. That's awesome. Get some momentum going. So we get the Jets. Uh, second game in November. Then we get the Panthers and the Giants. So that's a pretty easy uh, start to the end of the season. Um, the Ravens are by far the hardest game there. All the other games are very winnable. And then you get to December, which is obviously the last month of the year. And then, uh, then we get to play the Jets again, the Saints, Titans, and, and Patriots. So the last mid to end of the year is fairly easy. I mean... The Giants won six games last year. The Jets are terrible. The Panthers, they're a good team. They're underrated. But we could definitely win that game, especially in Miami. Houston's awful. The Ravens are the hardest team that we have to play in the last two months of the year. The Titans are worse than they were a year ago. They lost a lot of players last year. You know, they lost Humphreys. They lost Johnny Smith. Um, They lost Corey Davis. So their offense isn't as good as it was a year ago. 
Um, and their defense got a little bit better, but it's still not good. I mean, Bud Dupree is their best pass rusher, and I don't think he's good by himself. New Orleans got worse. Obviously, they lost Drew Brees. They lost some players in the secondary with Janoris Jenkins. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the Patriots, we get to play them at home, and we all know how that usually goes. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty good end of the year. It's, a, it's way easier than it was a year ago, and I'm so happy that we, we saved the Jets. for. When was the last time we got the Jets? Maybe in, like, 2013, maybe? It was the last time we got to play the Jets in December or November. Um... It's been a while. It's usually we we've been playing Buffalo a lot in a later year. Lately, at least, thank God dude, that switched up. That's huge, guys. That's huge. Uh, so this schedule is way easier than it was a year ago. I mean, last year we had to play the NFC West and AFC West. We had to play Kansas City. Um, our last, the end of our last, um, the, the last, excuse me, the December last year and November was brutal. I mean, we had to go to Buffalo. The Kansas City game, all of that stuff. So this is a way easier schedule than it was a year ago. Um, easier divisions to play, which is nice. We have to play the um, NFC uh, South, and then obviously we play the... Um, who the heck did we play in the AFC again? I'm, why am I drawing a blank? I just looked at it. We play the AFC South, right? Yeah, we play the AFC South and the NFC South. I don't know why I draw the blank. So, yeah, that's significantly easier than the AFC West and the AFC East. Or, not the AFC East, excuse me. The AFC West and the um, NFC uh, West. So, yeah, it's, it's easier than it was a year ago. You marry that with a dang uh, better team that, that just won 10 games and it got better. Woo! Oh, it's about to get... Oh, it's going to be a good year, guys. I'm very excited about this. So, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Always love doing them. Let me know, let me know uh, what you guys thought in the comment section below, and I'll see you guys in the next one.